Uh, I would like to know, where do you think that DMs go wrong with naval and aquatic campaigns? It feels like there should be so much opportunity and so much to explore, but lots of times they feel quite limited and that uh, a lot of these, uh, these things have been done before. So where do people go wrong with campaigns of this kind? I don't know. Let's roll for it. Sure. I got, I got a, a 16. I got a 1. Come on, Dan. Um, <laughs> where they go wrong, uh, they don't spend enough time on the boat. You think so? That's getting off the ship too often? Yeah. The boat it becomes a uh, travel piece rather than a moving fortress for your party. Uh, when you start doing aquatic and naval campaigns, your ship should be something you spend a significant amount of time customizing and building. That's part of the reason why people go into these kind of campaigns. So having um, just your like Google image boat thrown on your Roll20 or whatnot, it, it, man, it, it, it's insufficient. Let your party get weird. Have interesting crew. If you're the DM, build every member of that crew. And, and have interesting tags and story. Uh, there's something I'm doing right now. You obviously have a lot of thoughts about this. You're ready to ramble about uh, this. You, I could see you gearing up. And the, uh, honestly, one other thing for me, they don't understand the rules, the aquatic rules. They yeah, just don't. It. And it seems like it's a lot. But we went through our aquatic adventures episode. It's not as much as it seems. A lot of it is circumstantial that you don't need to know. No, it, it's it's daunting on the face value. But once you dig into it, it's really not bad. No, honestly, I'm not worried about overland travel. Uh, my exploration is is different. Like, my social encounters are a whole lot less because there are fewer of them. I, I have a contained little story with a slightly different rule set, but it's not breaking the wheel on this. Like, mm -hmm. this is, this is it's pretty straightforward. More people should do this. Aquatic campaigns are awesome. It's a Mimic, the Roundtable Dungeons & Dragons discussion podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another episode in our conversation on mob mentalities, where we look at some of the fishy humanoids out there that can make up the enemy armies in Dungeons & Dragons. I'm Adam, and with me today is Dan, and this episode is my favorite title so far, and it is Aquatic Mobs, Gills Gone Wild. Groan. I'm sorry it didn't rhyme. God, you are one note. <laughs> We've covered the three big underwater civilizations in the previous episodes, Sahuagin, Sea Elves, and Tritons, but the aquatic world in D&D is relatively undersupported. So we've reached out to our army of friends and allies to help us break down what the remaining warfaring underwater peoples look like in 5th edition, specifically the Merfolk, the Muro, and the Kuotoa. Let's start with the Merfolk. Of all the aquatic mobs and races in 5th edition, the merfolk are seemingly the least supported and explored. Here's what we know about their description. They have the top half of a humanoid and the bottom half of a fish. They have skin and scales, and that's it. That's what we get for description for fucking mermaids, man. <laughs> so, where are the eyes, hair, fins, web fingers? Like, there's nothing about any of that. We don't even get an idea of coloring. We at least get that with... with the different fur and scale patterns of kobolds and, and Aladrin, and there's nothing for merfolk. Mm -hmm. The artwork shows us a blue-skinned woman, the same color of the opera singer in the fifth element. She has flared ears that look like fins, a giant web fin on her head that acts like a mohawk, and additional fins on the back of her forearms and hips. She has pointed fingertips with webbing, and the smooth, shiny lower half seems to be much longer than a human's legs would be, and wraps and curls almost like an eel before it flares out in a series of broad, wispy fins. She's got narrow eyes, some sort of basic pattern on her lower half, and what looks like gills on her cheeks and chin, but it is hard to tell. There are no other signs of gills anywhere in the artwork, and no scales or hair to be seen either. Mm -hmm. She wears tight, minimalistic clothing, including seemingly useless belts, and wears a handful of bobbles that dangle off of her in ways that would be annoying if she ever swims horizontally. They're going to get caught on shit. Yeah. It looks like there's metal, leather, and cloth among her adornments, but I'm not sure Murpho can produce such materials on their own. Uh, oh yeah, I never actually thought about that. The artwork is evocative, sure. And I spent more time looking at the art for clues than reading the lore because the lore gives us precious little to work with, considering how widespread the flavor text makes them out to be. 
They are apparently everywhere that is shallow enough to have sunlight penetrate the waters, which we know from episode 117 is up to a thousand feet. Although, these creatures will probably pop in pressures below depths of 500 feet. Mm-hmm. Remember, Tritons had the ability to withstand this, this deep water, this deep sea um, environment. Merfolk don't get that detail. No. We know that merfolk live in tribes and small kingdoms that focus on hunting and gathering, but they can't forge metal, make martial weapons, shape stone, or keep written records. Every one of these tribes is different and will have different philosophies, colorations, and cultures, but we're not given any examples. Other mobs have been given pages of lore, random tables to roll on, or multiple stat blocks with cultural clues, but merfolk get about a third of a page. It does say in the Monster Manual that merfolk very rarely have a leader that unifies them, but... They have been known to combine strengths and unite as a species to deal with a common threat and that this can be the origin of a great undersea kingdom with dynasties that last for generations. But that seems to sit a little bit at odds with the simple disorganized villager lifestyle that the rest of the lore implies. They don't necessarily come off as living in the massive castle that the Little Mermaid showed us. Yeah, they're, they're definitely not your Disney princess. No, not by a damn sight. And there's no reason why. They also don't give us what these threats are. We know that they live in undersea caverns, coral reefs, structures they carve in rocky seabeds, or the ruins of sunken cities. So just, you know, literally all the places you would expect to find them. Yeah. There's nothing new and unique there. They farm the seabed, which raises more questions than it answers. (laughs) They herd schools of fish, which I have some world building questions about. And they harvest coral for unknown reasons. They just do. Okay. Remember, coral is living. So they're harvesting it. Like you would harvest plants, but for what? Building materials? No, they said that they shape reefs and they, they carve into rocky undersea beds. Tools? I don't know. In their living spaces, they rely on bioluminescent light from flora and fauna, most of which pulses, giving an eerie alien feeling to the area. I would really like to see some artwork of that. That can be really cool and evocative. Ghosts of Saltmarsh let us down with the underwater side of aquatic adventures. Yeah. The surface level stuff, the islands, the ships, great. Underwater, uh, we don't have any of this. And I'm curious to know what bioluminescent shit is out there besides the, oh, it's jellyfish that we get in the monster manual. It's algae. I would hope so. Yeah. But I would hope that there's a whole bunch of other like really cool kind of like herbivore um, anglerfish. Right, like we we could get some some really interesting uh, electric eels that aren't dangerous and mm-hmm. shit like that. Yeah. Anyway, other than that, we know they carry spears and they scavenge shipwrecks and beaches for materials from the land, and we know that almost all encounters with land dwellers are accidental and fleeting, despite the tales that fishermen tell of romantic entanglements. And yet, despite their social distance from the surface world, they can breathe both air and water. They speak common as well as Aquin, and notice that it's Aquin now but not primordial like Tritons. So 5th edition can't make up its mind where these merfolk sit Mm -hmm. with the land settlements. And that's it. That's what we got. No magic, no religion, no technology, no combat, no society, no options. Just a simple kind of aquatic humanoid who seems limited by the lack of attention that they've received in 5th edition. And it's downright contradictory. I mean, there's not even a whiff of the Sahuagin in their lore, which is odd because they share the same kind of geography and are both fairly large populations. Apparently, yeah. So, let's look at the stat blocks and see what we can learn about them there. First up is Brad, who's in the Yawning Portal. Thanks, Adam and Dan, for that breakdown on the merfolk. Uh, Let's take a dive into the stat block for the merfolk. So, we're looking at... uh, Low CR for your standard merfolk. It's a CR of 1 8th. I mean, you're not going to be facing these guys alone too often. Uh, that said, if you do see one, you're more likely to probably have a social encounter, in my opinion. But that said, if it goes wrong quickly, you should be able to dispatch one of these guys fairly easily. Uh, with a CR of 1 8th, they're looking at an armor class of only 11. Hit points, 2d8 plus 2 for an average 11. So again, nothing really there. Uh, moving speed of 10 feet with a swim speed of 40 feet. So get these guys out of water and they're not going to be much of a threat at all. But again, they're not likely to be out of water or far from it. Uh, strength, they're going to have a average strength, a slightly better than average dex, slightly better than average con, average int, average wisdom, and a slightly better than average charisma. So interesting, no 
No stat below 10, which is interesting to note for a CR 1-8 creature, but nothing spectacular either. Your highest bonus you're going to get is plus 1 in any given skill. Uh, they are skilled in perception, and they can speak Aquan and Common. They are amphibious, so they can breathe in and out of water. But again, as I said, you're not likely to find them out of water given the 10-foot movement speed and the fins, no legs. And for weapon attacks, they have a spear. With that spear, they can go either uh, melee or ranged attacks on the range, up to 20 feet or 60 feet with disadvantage. And they're going to have plus two to hit, whether that be thrown or in melee. Uh, if they throw it, it's going to do 1d6 piercing damage, so three on average, or 1d8 damage if used with two hands to make a melee attack. So take your pick on how you want to attack. I mean, if you're in melee, you're going to be attacking two-handed, but otherwise you're going to be throwing it for the 1d6. Uh, again, not much threat to these guys. Uh, threat is going to come in numbers once you start to add, you know, 8 to 10 of these guys, and you want to take an, a shot at them. You're looking at a CR 2 in a bit, but with action economy, I mean, it's still it's only going to be 8 attacks. Your party's going to be probably putting out more than that even at low levels, so really, merfolk, not the most dangerous threat on the face of the earth, at least not in small numbers. You're going to run into issues with these guys when you cut, run into a pack of them. When they outnumber you severely, uh, you know, 8 to 1, then maybe they're, you're going to have a bit of a threat. Uh, that said, I think there's a lot of really interesting roleplay potential for merfolk. I didn't see anything about the siren song that you hear from, you know, mermaids from our world, but no reason you can't put that in. Um, and early on in a campaign, to come across them would certainly be an interesting chance for your party to kind of practice on some cannon fodder, uh, get used to using their abilities if you want to throw a combat at them. But otherwise, save these guys for as maybe guides or as support for the party in some way. Make it social. Uh, don't bother with these guys in combat unless you really want to throw a horde of them at them or it's a really simple early encounter. Well, that's about all I have to say for Merfolk. Back to you, Adam and Dan. So my, my right off the bat, the first thing that I, I want to point out here is how annoyed I am that they are humanoids and neutral. Um, normally when I think of Merfolk, I'm going to Peter Pan. I'm going to old tales of... Um, playful and dangerous even, sea women even right? lady in the water yeah right like the, these these are supposed to be like fey like and chaotic but here they're just bleh. yeah they're just those guys over there in the water I yeah mean, i don't understand why they are humanoids at best they're monstrosities they're not a playable race so why do they make them humanoids yeah right like it, it, it they're it feels like they just under designed this like it, it's a it's a spot that fell through the cracks I can't wrap my brain around the idea that they have taken away their legs, which essentially ties them to the water, but then they give them a walking speed of 10 feet. So slither speed, because it kind of looks like an eel's leg. Right? Like, they don't even give them the requirement that they need to be submerged every four hours like the Sahu again. I'm moving on from eel's leg, bro, yeah, no, which I'm is not, what I I'm can. going to call my <laughs> penis from now on. <laughs> Goddamn, you have man. arguably the most famous aquatic humanoid in all of human knowledge, and you reduce their dependence on water to be a flavorful option. Speaking common is bad enough, but keep your mermen and mermaids in the fucking water. At least make them prone if they're flopping around on their eel leg. <laughs> I, I Honestly, man, like I sit there and I'm like, did they go, okay, we got Triton. Triton are awesome. We're going to do Triton. And we got sea elves. We're covered with sea elves. Oh shit, we got to put mermaids in. But we already have Triton. We can't rename them. Ugh. Well, I'm sure that merfolk came first. If you go back in the, like, annals of Dungeons & Dragons... Oh, 100%, but they were built like what we get with Tritons. Yeah, only with legs. Yeah, right? right? I, I I don't know, man. I mean, Brad's right when he says that the threat with these creatures is simply using their large numbers, I guess. Um, and relying on an action economy, as you would with their large numbers, but... Otherwise, the most interesting strategies you're going to have with these guys are going to be based around drowning or regular water mechanics. There's nothing um, really interesting with them. I mean, relying on resistance to fire damage from being submerged. Assuming they're submerged, they're flopping around 10 right? feet at a time, right? I, 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 they feel underdeveloped. Yeah. So, And that's it. That's it. That is all that we have on the basic merfolk. 
it is pretty freaking underwhelming. To say the least. Yeah. I mean, once again, did you notice what's missing from the stat block here? Dark vision. Dark vision. I want them to have it, but you know what? When I'm looking at this one, I don't think it's an, an omission. I don't think that it's quite as egregious as it was with the Tritons before the Triton errata that came yep. out recently. The fact that the lore spends about a tenth of its words on describing the merfolk's relationship with light, including their depths yeah, and their bioluminescence yeah. and whatnot, fine, you can have this one. If I'm going to, I'm going to kind of soft serve you this oversight and say, sure, why the fuck not? But Dan, why? They're social encounters. Brad's right. They are just there to be social encounters. They are just there for being exploration guides. But without any sort of support from WotC, from Wizards of the Coast, which, heh, Wizards of the Coast, you think they would have this, they're on the <laughs> coast, um, it's going to be up to DMs to homebrew their mermaids. It just is. Okay, right. So, there is, however, an additional merfolk stat block that's not in the monster manual. Okay, and that's the salvager from the pages of Ghosts of Saltmar. Sure. Now, we're going to have one of our favorite Midwesterners, Pepperina. Who's going to break down the Sealager stats here in a moment? God damn! Why did we go to like the most landlocked person in our in our group to cover a mermaid? Hey guys, it's Pepperina, still here at the Lucky Liar Tavern in Lonelywood. Yesterday, a guy came in off a fishing boat and was telling me about this shipwreck he came across. He swore he saw something swimming around it that looked like part human and part fish. It seemed to be collecting things from the wreckage. I asked if she had red hair and a little fish friend, but sadly, she did not. It was, however, a merfolk salvager. These are skilled warriors of merfolk that scour wrecks and ruins with rapier-like weapons made from living coral. They often escort other merfolk to these places using their keen senses to detect danger. A merfolk salvager is a medium humanoid and they have an armor class of 12 and their hit points are 22 or 4d8 plus 4. They have a speed of 10 feet or a swim speed of 40 feet. When I told my daughter that, she said, so they just kind of scoot when they're on land? <laughs> I said, I think so. <laughs> um, getting into their stats, their highest is dex. Um, they're pretty average with intelligence and wisdom, and they have a plus one to strength, con, and charisma. Their saving throw is a dex plus four. Their skill proficiencies are athletics plus three and perception plus two. And their passive perception is a 12. They can speak aquan and common, and their challenge rating is a one, which goes up quite a bit from your average merfolk at a an eighth, I believe it was. They are amphibious and can breathe air and water. For their actions, they get to make two attacks with their coral rapier, and that is a melee attack with a plus four to hit, a reach of five feet. They can target one target with six or a 1d8 plus two piercing damage. They do have a special ability to inject toxins twice per day, and that is a melee attack with a plus four to hit, a reach of five feet for one target. On a hit, it is six or 1d8 plus two piercing damage, and the creature must succeed on a DC 12 constitution saving throw or be paralyzed until the end of its next turn. Now, I like these guys for a few different reasons. As I looked at the lore of the merfolk, it said they lack the resources to make weapons, shape stone, and build cities. So it makes a lot of sense that some of them would go off and salvage what they could find on shipwrecks. I also love the flavor of them having a weapon made out of coral as they use what is around them. And it, in turn, it gives them the inject toxin ability as many corals contain toxins. Reading about these got me thinking how much fun an all underwater campaign would be. Having all your party members be an underwater race and really getting to explore all those areas and species we don't normally get to see. I think I just heard them say last call, so I gotta run. 
If you need to get a hold of me, you can find me on Instagram at pepperina underscore sparkle gym. And I am now on Twitch where you can find me painting minis and building terrain and probably talking about dragons. And that is twitch.tv slash pepperina underscore sparkle gym. Thanks, guys. Back to you. Okay, I'm with Peps. I love the idea of the living coral rapier. I I think it I totally have it as an enchanted scabbard that's always full of salt water so I could hand this out to my players, right? And keep the coral alive. I, I know that coral is actually really fragile in real life, but this imagery is too good to pass up. I really like this weapon. I I'm 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 with you. I just can't get over the coral. Coral <laughs> Coral Um I I okay, you know what? Seriously, I got to ask, how are they injecting this toxin? Is Pepperina right? Is it just some special kind of attack with that same weapon? With the rapier? Or... Uh, look, honestly, if it was, it would be a part of the rapier breakdown, yeah. right? Right. And, and I mean, Wizards of the Coast don't seem to like to double up on things like that, generally speaking. So, if we look at what it tells us in the book, we see that... Um, it's not a range attack. So are, are, are they implying that merfolk have toxic spines? Um, is there a stinger? Have they harvested the toxin from a jellyfish and applied it that way? I, there's so many questions. It, it's this. They just don't of, give a fuck about merfolk. No, right? But, but I mean, this is another one of the design things that we've mentioned before where there is so much missing in what they're not telling us. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's a salvager. I'm going to make them salvage this from poisonous sea cucumbers right like sure and have the uh have the party run across a bunch of the salvagers farming these sea, these sea yeah they just there have the go. sea cucumber in one hand and then they've got their rapier and they're just sliding the rapier back visual uh, medium never mind dan yeah if you're going to jerk off like that in front of me at least don't point it at me thank you very much that's not what you said last night <laughs> so the other thing that seems to be implied by this increased stat block is that only the strongest merfolk are going to be salvaging, right? We see that because they have better stats yeah. than the standard one. Whether it's because it's considered dangerous or there's a cultural reason, like, we we don't know. I, myself, would probably chalk this up to survival of the fittest. Maybe there's a coming-of-age ritual, so only those in their prime are going on these kinds of missions, but I don't know. I just suggest everyone visits their local aquarium and ask to speak with the manager to get more details about merfolk. <laughs> that that's that sounds like a good idea, right? Honestly, the whole idea of the uh, the scavenger just it's them trying to have you, the little mermaid level, you know, look at my stuff isn't it neat, right? Like that's that's I, what it feels like. I don't know why they just don't have nets, increased movement speed and lower hit points. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, man. These okay. guys are frustrating. Look, the only other info we really have about Merfolk is in the DMG, and that's what to do when you want to build an NPC. You take the NPC stat block that you want, you add the amphibious trait. Why? Give the NPC the adjusted movement speed of 10 feet on land and 40 feet on water, and then give them Aquan and Common. And that's simple and straightforward, right? Like, that's, that's it. I, yeah, I mean, all of that makes sense, I guess. So... Let's roll initiative here, because I got a couple of questions. Sure. 19. Two. We hit, we hit the opposite <laughs> ends there. Okay, so how do you slot these guys into the world of the Forgotten Realms with Sea Elves, Sahuigan, and Tritons? Uh, on, honestly, uh, these guys, I would say, are part of the Triton Society. Yeah, you're going to put them in you, there? You cannot have them be solo. You can't. Well, they, they, you don't the, have enough support for them to be solo. But, but they have to be because the Tritons are deep water far away that you never see. And these guys are really close. These are like lagoons and beaches and and coral reefs and shit that are right there. They're up at the breakwater, whereas Tritons are way out. I Maybe they're a distant relative. Maybe they're sea elves that got too ambitious. I don't know. I, 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 I would ha I'd have them hang out with sea elves. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Um, I think that maybe that there's uh, sea elves um, that are like... Uh, Maybe, maybe merfolk are just that added step. And, and I know I'm kind of taking that hard left away from their established lore. Such as it is. The, the, all seven sentences of it. Um, the I could see merfolk. You know how we have sea elves because sea elves have spent that long and have evolved to take part of the sea in 
like uh, be more comfortable in the sea. They have these aquatic traits because evolution has brought them to this point right yeah, they were elves that yeah. then inhabited the coast and eventually the sea right um why aren't merfolk just sea elves that never got back out of the water i'm gonna hit it from the other direction because elves at least have fey ancestry and all that shit but right? mermaids should be fey like they they should be they should be but these this version is not this version is, is this m night Shyamalan lands is this Instead of coming from the elf and from the biped side of things, are they are they truer versions of the uh, plane of water? Because they're they're fish based that grew arms instead of human based that grew tail. Are they truer, simpler versions of just lower on the evolutionary scale? I'm not sure. I mean, you could also look at them like monstrosities. Some some wizard at some point in time went all mad science with, you know, a supermodel and a guppy and threw it in the water. Like, this, this, that could be how they came across. Like, we don't know. We don't have that sort of information. And because of the lack of information and the fact that we have that surface dwelling aquatic creature in sea elves already and we have that deep water aquatic creature with tritons. Oh, man, like... I don't want to make them outsiders. I don't want to make them extra planar. Um, I would far rather just make them more humanoid style. Unless they're like fae. Centaur. Unless they're a fae. Unless they're fae. Like centaur. They, they should be. Centaurs are not fae. They're humanoids. But they should be fae. But they should be fae. That's what I'm trying to say. Right? Like centaur should have fae uh, flavoring. Yeah. Um, the, the, the humanoid monstrosities to me are all fae based. And the traditional lore supports that. Except the Simic hybrids, but that's a Ravnica thing. That's, that's a different. Ravnica thing. Yeah. That's different. That's 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 mad science. Let's put that. That's that's Island monstrosity. Doctor, yeah, that's Island of Doctor Moreau level shit. Yeah, you know what? Honestly, I am underwhelmed. Merfolk for me are going to be social encounters to help you guide your ship through the rocky uh, shore, right? In order to get to this. One dangerous island. First, you have to talk to the merfolk. That's what they are for me. Like, and that's their purpose. That's all. That's what they have. I'm not going to the merfolk civilization. Honestly, I am removing tritons from my campaign, giving them tails, calling them merfolk, and using triton stat blocks. That's oh, what I'm doing. so you're removing merfolk from the campaign and just reskinning? Well, no. I'll have, still have a scavenger. I'll still have that thing. I'm just to me, triton and merfolk should just be the same creature oh i i I hard disagree with that you look at the way that uh that theros handled tritons they are so weird but that's theros that's theros i'm okay with it in theros because theros is like tritons have that greek uh backing and that's all theros what the fuck do you think mermaids come from man Uh, peter pan all right how are you going to use these guys in a campaign do you have a plot hook for them what is what is something besides the oh the mermaid shows up and flashes the boobs and all those sailors are like oh hello sea boobs <laughs> right like okay so we're gonna put that out of the out of the way and of course we're not gonna hit Disney inspired no. right what are you left with what new unique thing are you gonna do with merfolk the new unique thing I want to do with merfolk I, I I've got uh, the disenchant uh, disenchantment cartoon stuck in my head where they have like the the sirens and the merfolk that seduce the seamen but they're just manatees like literal manatees and then matt barry's character has an orgy with them because matt barry is awesome but that's a side that's a side note um would they not be wool manatees uh they have a siren song but uh the idea of the siren is where i find we have sirens though but we have sirens so my plot hook for them is sirens are just mermaids gone bad in my mind. Oh, man. But that's not the D&D lore. That's not the D&D lore. I've got to break the lore to come up with my own thing for a plot hook with these guys. They're so underwhelming, under-supported. There's not a lot of lore. You get okay, One of the scavengers finds an item that uh, you need. It's such an underhanded, toss, low-hanging fruit of them. Go have a MacGuffin quest and find that one mer- merfolk. Okay. All, All right. right. Like, I... I, I all right, all right, here's what I got, okay? Sure. First and foremost, if you have to go explore a shipwreck that is half submerged yep. at the beach, this is where you run into your scavengers. Um, the placement of the scavengers in the Ghost of Saltmarsh book is not bad. No. So um, 
when I look at this, you, how many times do you go off into the woods and you take a guide with you in D&D and you have like you hire a freaking guide and mm. there's an NPC that travels along with you? You're talking about this floating fortress, right? That is the ship. Well, it does move. You will need a guide through some areas. That's really all that merfolk are to me. But it's a constant NPC that can have unique um, perspectives on the way that that the environment works, but also question some of the society and whatnot as well, um, because they don't know what the land people are like. Cool. Do you name him Kevin Costner? No. Okay. That was a water no. world joke. No, I might name it Ken Griffey Jr. And that was a baseball joke because of the Seattle Mariners. Oh, hey, there you go. You see what I did there? Yeah. Anyway, uh, enough stupid references, and let's stop talking about merfolk as much as we can. Let's, yes, please. Let's cut to a break and run into the next thing, which is um, merfolk on crack. Hello, podcast people. Podcast people? We're recording. Yes, but it makes them sound like pod. We're people. recording. You're recording. Fuck. Hello, podcast people. We've got a couple of things going on that you might not know about, and so we thought we'd cut away to a little reminder. First of all, we just want to point everyone to our YouTube channel again. We appreciate that all of you listen on your respective favorite podcast apps, but the It's a Mimic YouTube page has all of our shows laid out in playlists. That means you can listen to our Dragon episodes back-to-back, or dig through the Campaign Builder, or touring the Multiverse series, without scrolling through the backlog or having to use a search function. New episodes get uploaded within a week of airing on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever, but the whole backlog is up there. Even the episodes we're embarrassed about. Yeah, fuck, those early cold opens were sloppy. Yeah. And delicious. The other thing we want to mention... Hey, Dan, you know what else is sloppy but delicious? Whatever you're going to say next is just going to get cut, so... Well, uh, the other thing we want to mention is our sneaky little store that lives an unassuming little life on our website. There are stickers, magnets, phone cases, notebooks... Cups, water bottles, coffee mugs, and travel mugs. I could have a mug. I'm tired of your ugly mug already, man. I want a mug. Ooh. We even have masks in a variety of sizes because we're socially conscious people. The current designs are for the It's a Mimic mic and the Deep Dark Irradiance logo, but we'll be updating the store as time goes on. How big are the mugs? I don't know. There's a standard one and a tall one. And a travel mug too. Jesus, I need to look at this website more often. So, please take a second to check out what we have to offer. We really appreciate the donations we've received through the website, but we want to make sure that you guys have the option of getting something for your hard-earned money. Every little bit helps keep the lights on and the side projects rolling, and we love you for your support. So thank you to everyone out there who visits www.itsamimic.com and checks out our online store there. (laughs) There's even a little pin with a logo on it. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel for perusing the older episodes. Now... Without any further delay, let's head back to the show. Jesus, there are three different kinds of stickers, Dan. We are capitalist whores. Will you please take these damn commercials seriously? No. Eons ago. Buckle up, Dan. You ready for this? Anytime you start with a sentence, uh, start a sentence with eons ago, I, I, I lean back and get comfortable. Eons ago. It's going to take a while. <laughs> a tribe of merfolk discovered a strange idol and brought it to their king. He and members of his court examined it, but no one could decipher its strange symbols or ominous meanings. But it soon became clear that anyone who touched it was driven mad, including the king. Obsessed, he called for a massive sacrificial ritual where scores of merfolk were slaughtered until the ocean turned red. But the ritual was complete, and a portal opened up, and the king and his followers were sucked through the gate and into the lower plains. The idol had been of Demogorgon, and the poor merfolk had been swept into the abyss. Generations of torture, insanity, and dark magics were brought down upon the merfolk and their descendants in the abyss, and the demons within it twisted the once peaceful mermen and mermaids into gigantic evil abominations known now as Murrow. When the opportunity arises, Demogorgon will send a host of Murrow back to the Material Plane to terrorize and murder anyone near the coastal waters. They attack anything smaller or weaker than them, eating any creature that crosses their path. They are savage monstrosities with enough intelligence to carve out and defend territory and to take treasures of their conquests back to their lairs. These large-sized horrors often 
tie the inedible parts of their drowned victims to strands of kelp rising from the seabeds so they can mark the borders and display their brutality. Just like you can't talk about Sahuagin without mentioning their enemies, you can't talk about Merfolk without talking about theirs. Muro are chaotic evil nightmares who loosely resemble large merfolk. According to the art, their overall physiology is the same, although their hands are no longer webbed and they instead sport long, vicious claws. They're more muscular with demonic and bestial influences and it's clear just by looking at them that they are far deadlier opponents than merfolk. Speaking of deadly demonic creatures that don't have webbed fingers probably, let's jump over to Megan, <laughs> who has some information on these coastal aquatic hunters. All right, guys. Hey, it's Megan here. Uh, still on site at Castle Ravenloft, and I won't lie, there have been a few weird ghost sightings recently. Um, nothing too dangerous, just some moved items and um, some weird noises at night, but we're keeping an eye on it. Um, but this actually made me super interested in digging into more of the hauntings of the sea. So, kind of more specifically, the Miro. They are technically a large monstrosity and chaotic evil. Think about it, they come from the abyss. They are Demogorgon born. They are just evil as fuck. They just kill for the sake of killing. And I love this for them. <laughs> they have an armor of 13. It's natural armor. Um, water folk, of course, they've got their scales, so they're going to have a little bit of a tougher skin. Their hit points are a pretty interesting pool. It's only 6, D10, plus 12, so around 45. They are a challenge rating of 2, so I feel like one of these, if you're fighting it, is pretty easy to take down as like a full party. But if you had a few of these within a dwelling, I feel like it would be pretty, pretty tough to, um, to get a bearing on them, especially when I talk about some of their stats and capabilities. So they do have a speed of 10 if they're on land, which obviously they don't have any legs. They do are like really, really creepy serpenty sea creatures, but their swim speed, of course, is 40. So if you end up in water with one of these, you will not be able to outswim it. They do have dark vision of only 60 feet, which I find very strange because we have talked about water creatures before who have dark vision of a further distance, like 120, upwards of 120 feet. And these guys are, they come from the abyss. They actually live within the dark, deep depths of the water. So it just doesn't make sense to me why they only have a 60. Be interested to hear your guys' thoughts on that. And they do have a passive perception of 12. So again, I feel like they, you can't really pull the wool over these eyes here, but they are built a little bit more strength based. So to go over some of their stats here, they do have a plus four in strength. Their dex is zero. Their constitution is two. Intelligence is negative one. Wisdom is zero and charisma is negative one. So they are built like fighting water tanks, basically. So not overly magical, not overly intelligent, but of course, smart enough to know that you are meat and it will eat you and it will use you to scare other people away, which is pretty, pretty dope. For languages, they do have abyssal. I mean, think about it. They do come from the abyss and then Aquin. So they speak the language of the water, I guess. So they are amphibious. So the Miro can breathe air and water. Um, and interesting about these ones is they don't have the disadvantage of um, suffocating if they are outside of water, which is absolutely frightening. Yes, they only have a 10 speed when on land, but can you imagine one of these monstrosities coming at you when you're like sitting on the beach in the sand? It just starts crawling up on the sand at your feet. Just fucking frightening. For attacks, um, they do have a multi-attack, so technically it could take two swipes at you, one with a bite and one with claws or its harpoon. Uh, so with bite, it's a melee attack, obviously. Of, it is a melee attack of plus six to hit with a 1d8 plus four piercing damage. And then its claws are pretty much the same, so plus six to hit with a 2d4, plus four slashing damage. But the interesting cool thing about these guys is that they do carry the classic harpoon style weapon. So this guy is a plus six to hit. Uh, it does have a range of 20 to 60 feet should you want to throw it. And it is a 2d6 plus four piercing damage. However, the fun thing is, is that if the target is a huge or smaller creature, it must succeed on a strength contest against the Miro or be pulled up to 20 feet toward it. So it, it is a legitimate harpoon if it throws it at you, right? Um, and then it will pull you back towards it. So this is a very, very easy creature to drown you because I'm imagining it <clears throat> harpooning you from the side of your ship, bringing you and dragging you into the water where you cannot outswim it. And then you are 
toast or dead in the water, shall we say. But I think that would be, I think that is one of the more fun aspects to it. I think it's really neat that these are merfolk that went into the abyss and basically just came out without any magic capabilities, just stronger, bigger tanks. Like they're just, they're built to fight because they were fighting to survive. It had nothing to do with magic. It had nothing to do with imbuing them with special boons or special magic skills or capabilities. Literally just, they fought to survive and became strong because of it, which I think is a very interesting thing to consider and think about that there are so many different levels to being on a magical plane and not being a magical creature. So interested to hear what you guys' thoughts are on these. Uh, would you use them to scare your players? Would you use them as uh, warning signs for your players? Or how would you actually use them? But yeah, I'm going to throw it back to you, audience. Obviously, you can follow me on Instagram at 0 mega zero, uh, just for some fun D&D &D art, video game, that kind of stuff, and just my life. And of course, feel free to DM me for any questions, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. But yeah, have you guys a great week, and we will chat again. Bye. <laughs> Megan, while these are tank-type creatures in the ocean, calling them water tanks just <laughs> makes me laugh. As someone who has owned aquariums, water tanks are something very fucking different. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about it, Adam. We're going to bring it up. Megan wants a greater range on the dark vision for these guys. Honestly, I'm just glad it got included at this point. <laughs> but once again, it's implied that the dark vision is something magical that is bestowed upon a creature by an effect, an environment or powerful deity or quasi deity level creature. It doesn't seem to be something that any creature manifests naturally through evolution. We see that with the fact that bats don't get it. Yeah. And yet wargs do. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. When Megan was talking about the murrow crawling up the beach at you, all I could think about was the merman from Cabin in the Woods. <laughs> that is a great movie, and I actually had to look up the clip on YouTube and watch it again because that is like my favorite part of it. Is it really? Oh, yeah. I, have you not seen Cabin in the Woods? I've seen it like four times. Yeah, okay. Oh, please. It, please. It, is, it is so good. But that thing, I was not prepared for how creepy and disgusting that was going to be. Yeah. Like, he kept talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, and I was really... Picturing like some sort of, of male aerial. Yep. And we did not get that. No, we did not. No, we did not. And like it, I found it jarring and it, it doesn't make my skin crawl or anything. I love how creepy and gross it is. I would like to have that level of disgusting, slimy, gross water creature crawling after you. That's great for Murrow. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, I also like this scorpion from Mortal Kombat level uh, attack they have, like this this harpoon that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it it's probably got a rope attached to it. If you could get pulled forward toward the marrow, um, this is one of those buried little mechanics that the monster manual provides that I feel the adventuring section of the player's handbook should give players. Like, I want to see that pulling mechanic the harpoon and pull yeah uh, yeah that should be a thing at least ghost of salt marsh should have given that as an option yeah. yeah i've had many many characters both of my own and ones that i've dm'd who try to pull this stuff usually with an arrow and it really does need to be a spear like a it harpoon. needs to be a spear like how is an arrow carrying a rope like if it's a piece of twine shirt but then how are you pulling a 250 pound dude uh 250 pound dude wearing armor with a string of twine doesn't make sense so, I was surprised to discover during my research that there's actually another kind of murrow what? that exists out there. And it's from the pages of the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. Awesome. Um, sorry, we've been giving shit to everybody about pronouncing it wrong. And we ripped on Tyler for the Sahuigan thing. And he's been, like, sending me messages going, All right, so the reason that I've done this is... And, like, he's Aww. getting defensive about it. And I'm like, fuck you, Tyler. <laughs> Make me music. But no. Oh, dude. So, so dude. I, I am going to. I, I love you, Tyler. I am going to call it uh, Will de Muant. There we go, Tyler. We're even. So um, We already get enough shit from the, people the, that we mispronounce things. The Explorer's that. Guide to Will de Muant. I know that it's a different campaign setting. Okay, I get that. But I'm, and I'm not super well versed in it. In any of the critical role, lore, yeah. or any of that shit. Even, like, I'm a fan, but I I don't delve I, into it to the same extent others do. I'm eager to jump into the published material, but I don't, I mean, I just don't have time to catch yeah. up. So, I do know, though, that it looks like, going through the book, that Groomsh, 
the Raven Queen, Loth, and the rest are there. So I think it's safe to say that these Murrow still worship Demogorgon the way that that the standard stock ones do. Yeah, I I think so. And even though it isn't specifically stated in the book, I think that tracks and holds true. So anyway, uh, let's see what Kyle has to say about the Murrow Shallow Priest. Thank you, gentlemen. Kyle here again, coming to you live from the Tomb of Horrors on the Sword Coast. I thought I'd take a little time out of my busy schedule of dissecting dead adventurers today to talk to you about the legendary Murrow Shallow Priests. Once gentle merfolk who have been twisted by the dark abyssal powers of Demogorgon, the Prince of Demons, bullies and killers who target weaker foes in order to drag them and their treasures to the watery depths. They seek to flood the lands and open a portal to their master's domain. The shallow priests have learned to harness the magic of the elements, making them fearsome leaders among the Murrow. They are large monstrosities of the chaotic evil variety, sitting in a CR4 with 15 AC from their natural armor, 75 HP, and 10 feet of movement on land and 40 in the water. Their stats are slightly above average, with their two highest being strength and wisdom at a plus four and a plus three respectively, with their lowest being charisma at negative one. I guess with all the wanton murdering, they never quite got a grasp on good people skills. Go figure. They've also got 60 feet of dark vision, 13 passive perception, and speak abyssal and aquan. As for their abilities, they are amphibious and are considered 6th level spellcasters, with a mostly druid spellcasting list, although there are a few exceptions in there. Uh, they also have a plus 5 to hit on those, and a DC 13 spell save. In terms of their actions, they can make a harpoon attack, either ranged or melee, with a plus 6 to hit, a 5 foot reach for melee, and a range of 20-60 feet if they are throwing it. Uh, on a ranged hit, they can also pull the creature 10 feet closer to it if it is medium or smaller size. Or, for their action, they can also cast Lightning Bolt, releasing a 5 foot wide, 100 foot long blast of electricity. Each creature in that line must make a DC 13 dexterity saving throw, or taking 8d6 damage on a fail, or half that much on a success. I don't really understand why they include it in its action category when it still requires a spell slot to use, and the spell is also listed in its spell list. It seems kind of redundant, but maybe they just really want you to use that spell when playing them. I would say it's because it's not a druid spell, but they have several other non-druid spells in their list as well. As for how I use the Shallow Priests, Full disclosure, I probably wouldn't, but I'm also a little biased because I fucking hate water combat. Oh my god, it's just the fucking worst. I actually blame the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game for the NES for that. I think it traumatized me for life uh, from water combat, and I just don't want to revisit it. Too many sad, sad memories. But, twist my arm, if I had to use them... I'd probably play into their horror a bit, trying to make it a rather spooky scenario. Say your players are traveling by boat and they roll into a thick, heavy fog. Suddenly they are beset on all sides, with harpoons flying out of the mist, trying to drag adventurers into the water. Maybe light a sail on fire to give it a little extra sense of urgency. I'd definitely play them in numbers, lean into the fact that these creatures like to prey on weaker foes and just overwhelm them with numbers. Maybe add a chase scene into it for flavor and a chance to kill that one murder hobo just to teach him consequences. They could also be used in uh, like a rescue scenario. Uh, maybe they kidnap somebody and they're going to use them in a blood sacrifice to open up a portal to the elemental plane of water or to the abyssal plane or, you know, anything along that nature. Yeah, kind of try to play into their mythology. But what do I know? I fucking hate water combat, so... You do you. Anyways, folks, I gotta be getting back to my ministrations. Adam and Dan, back to you. Let's be 100% clear right now. If there's one thing that you should take away from this podcast, it's that the water level in the original Ninja Turtles game for the NES was fucking brutal, completely unnecessary, and is directly goddamn responsible for warping a generation of nerds so badly that we now have the term anxiety attack in our vocabulary. Fuck that level. Fuck that game. Fuck everything. Podcast over. Adam out. I mean, I like that. It wasn't that bad. Okay, so while Adam calms down, let me just say that Kyle is right. Lightning Bolt is included because it's going to be the go-to spell that the Shallow Priest relies on. 
I really appreciate it when a stat block has a spell breakdown because it means I'm going to be doing less flipping back and forth between books. And everybody knows I'm not a big fan of flipping back and forth between the books. Honestly, things like Fog Cloud and Misty Step are easy to jot down notes before the session. And spells like Minor Illusion and Dispel Magic are things I can build encounters around. So I would already be familiar with a lot of them. Um, before you go any further, okay, let's actually go through the spell down? list. Um, I, I still have a rage boner, but I'm pushing through it. Okay, so there's cantrips. Concerned. Okay, which is druid craft, minor illusion, and shocking grasp. Okay. So we're druid spell list here. Yes. For the shallow priest. I like that. That's fine. Um, minor illusion is neat. We're going to start to see some deception, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Shocking grasp is sticking with the lightning theme. Uh, at first level, you get four slots. For Cure Wounds, there's that healing that you didn't like. We also have Fog Cloud and Thunder Wave. Why does a demon-empowered underwater uh, demon cleric... Druid. Or demon druid choose Cure Wounds? Um, Because they're cut off from the abyss. It's because t- they've been survival-based from the time that the merfolk have been chased down. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like I they mean, could have... That feels like a justification for it. Like, it doesn't... Like it, it just feels odd that it has cure wounds. If you're going to give magic to to a group of, of I guess, refugees, really, if you're going to give them magic to say, hey, you need to live generation to generation to generation in this hostile environment that's going to twist and warp you, do you not give them healing abilities? Not, not if they're fueled by Demogorgon, who doesn't give two shits if they're... I really got the impression that, that the Abyss warped them and then Demogorgon took them. All right. Sure. So. I, I, I just, with with the absolute balls out destructive insanity of Demogorgon, I, I don't see him giving them the ability to cast. Well, weapons. you didn't have a problem with Druid Craft or Minor Illusion. Those, those are non, like, no, no, I don't have a problem with those. All right, well, okay, second level with three slots is whole person, mirror, image, and misty step. Sure. All of that's fine for All of that's fine for me. We got the deception. We've got the, um, we've got the destructive whole person. Like, whole person's low-key one of the best spells in the book. Okay, hot take there, but okay. Um, third level, three slots, dispel magic, lightning bolt, and sleet storm. They track. Yeah, you like that? Oh, yeah, all three of them track. Okay, well, let's... Just- Dispel magic's a bit weird, but it's it's not I as still, glaring. I as... still think that that's from their like their evolutionary story of all these demons are coming at them all the time. The abyss is warping them. They would have relied on the ability to dispel magic. Okay, why don't we see dispel magic in a lot of celestials? Uh, they should fucking have it. Okay, yeah, like right? that's uh, they, this is this is like the why don't dragonborn have dark vision? That's the same Dan thing. why don't dragons have spells like yes like, cut your losses yes. on yeah, this yeah. okay fair. so fair. don't fair don't be mad fair. that some things are getting it be mad that other things aren't okay so oh I am <laughs> grab, <laughs> grab, grab your die let's roll for initiative I got a four you got, a, got 12. a 12 how do Murrow fit in the landscape of underwater D&D creatures that we've covered so far <sighs> they are the um flind of the underwater. They really do feel like they are little gnolls that run around. Just yeah, dirty. right? Like, uh, they are all about destruction. They they are just that demonic underwater presence. Which, I mean, when you already have Sahuagin, when you already have um, Kraken and the Leviathan and all these other underwater threats, having these large-ass motherfuckers going around, you have great white sharks who are running away from these things. <laughs> Right? The fearless apex predator of the seas nopes the shit out when he sees these guys. All right, cool. Yeah, no, I like them. I, I like them. I like Marrow. And as adversaries, they're well supported and they have um, they have a good feel to them. Like they, I feel like they have enough as adversaries. They're never going to be a big bad evil guy in my campaign. No, but they're not designed to be. At CR2, like yeah. they're meant to fill in the gap and be threatening in tier two when you've got a handful of these guys together and then maybe one shallow priest well i mean cr2 for a large creature is a bit crazy especially when you're already dealing with the uh incompatibility of your land walking pcs in water right like 
what are the other CR2 large ogre? So are these things supposed to be comparable to ogre? Like is the average marrow just supposed to be like that level of comparison? That like a troll maybe? No, see, trolls base CR is five. Yeah, the the base troll is. But look, I like them for this low level because you're going to get them in groups. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's what they're designed for. They're not designed for low. Like yeah, they're CR two. But that doesn't if, mean if you're... this goes up against a CR2 party, your party's fucked. It's dead, right? right? And However, it's the same thing that we said in the other aquatic episodes. The moment you're in and around water, the thing that's meant to be there will rock your shit. However, six of these things against a level 12 party underwater, sure, they'll probably do okay. Do you agree with Megan and Kyle? Are these guys built around horror tropes? Anytime you got the abyss mixed in things, they're, you're, you're building horror tropes. Like, these, these are your... Uh, old aquatic nightmare stories right this is as close as we come in my opinion to creatures from the black lagoon yep now i know that sahuagin can actually walk on land and do that kind of shit and they even almost look like them physically the creature from the black lagoon right like i i get that but that's got a society it's not as bestial the the murrow really are bestial yeah. Right. They're coming out of the water to kidnap and pull you back and eat you and display your body. Like, it is far more horror than we have seen so far of the underwater creatures, the mobs that we've discussed. It, it feels like the uh, local shipping, the local ships and captains and the, the scuttlebutt, I can actually use that term appropriately now, the scuttlebutt of uh, uh, around the marrow will say, hey, in this uh lane in this shipping lane marrow have set up avoid it right and you'll have people going far out of their way on their ships adding days at a time to avoid the marrow so as a nice little plot hook you could throw in for these guys you guys got to go clear out the marrow to f open up a shipping lane I, I really like the idea of these guys having territory that you just don't go around yeah this is a reason why you do not take the direct route from island to island have you seen the uh, show it's new on Netflix called Shadow and Bone or Bone and Shadow. No. Okay. It's it's another one of these uh, preteen level uh, um, Hunger Games level shows. Um, however, there's this one area in it. We just started watching it, so I'm going to get some names wrong. But there's one area in it that is just it is the only way to the bordering country. Sure. But it kills people if they go in it. Sure. Right. Um, there is this. Uh, they take these large ship looking things and use elementalists to propel them through. Okay. I've, I've seen literally just the one episode, but I got this. This is the kind of feel I have where if you are going through marrow waters, everybody's quiet. You keep saying marrow like it's bone marrow. Oh, sorry. Murrow. Uh, if you are looking at these murrow uh, infested waters, you're looking at them like everybody's scanning the waters actively the entire time. There are no lights because they'll see you. Right. You want to... Um, Do not use a rowboat. Do not splash paddles. Right. Sails only and get through real fast. You you have that one uh, druid character slowly under their breath casting gusts to try to get through faster. Right? Like, there is a tenseness to Murrow water. I love that. I think that's, that's a, great, a great idea. Um, the last question that I have is, you didn't like the spell list. It seems weirdly expansive and whatnot. Is this a Mercerism? Uh, no. I know that he takes creative liberties with some creatures when mm. you, as every DM does. This is not a criticism. Yeah. But is this spell list something that he added for his campaign to make sense? And then it just got translated into written word and now we're trying to I, reverse I, engineer it. I have not seen a, a like from what I rec can recall of uh, where they are on ships in the second campaign. They don't ever have to deal with Murrow. I think it's just maybe something he built just in case the option came up. Um, and then it never did. And when he wrote the book, he put them in. Sure. Okay. Right. Um, and they, they track. They, they, they fit. I, 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 I like the fact that the, the Shallow Priest adds so much. I really like the monstrous additions from the Guide to Wilder Muant. But I'm not going to give us so much shit. But... <laughs> I, I'm not, I am I don't always follow the train of thought that yeah, got okay. us there, right? I think it's really cool and flavorful, but I've got to start to do some mental gymnastics to make it all fit. Like the Sahuagin, 
that are absolutely in love with their uh, Sokola. Except for these guys, this warlock from Wildemuant, which is the the uh, Uk'otoa, right? And I'm like, well, where'd that motherfucker come from, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, and again, that's not a criticism. It's just, I guess I need to know more about that campaign setting to understand why certain things are operating in certain ways. Well, on the bright side, I think they're, at the time we're recording this, 136 four-hour-long episodes of that campaign of that campaign plus there's another campaign before plus that. the one that's on Taldori beforehand which was like 114 episodes is Taldori like different than different country uh different continent but same planet same planet uh, okay. uh the... or realm whatever yeah normally at this time we would do a happy little shout out to our people out there in the wilds unknowns but i want to take this time to specifically congratulate pepperina on launching her new twitch stream She's one of the most talented terrain crafters and mini painters that we on this podcast know, not to mention one of the funniest and warmest people in the online D&D community. I know she uh, I know she gave her contact information before, but we'll say it again. No, no, no. again. We'll say it again now. Uh, and Ed and Lee, I can't I can't do it for too long. OK, all right. no, no. Uh, we'll add a link in the show notes. Um, you can find her Twitch channel. At twitch.tv slash pepperina underscore sparkle gem. Good luck, peps. You're awesome. We love you. We love that you're here with us on this journey. I just want to remind everyone that you can find the rest of us on Instagram, Facebook, and at r slash it's a mimic on Reddit. And of course, you can email us at info at it's a mimic dot com because we love it when you guys email us and send us messages and harass us about pronunciations or pronunciations or blah blah blah. So, what? <laughs> Please send us messages. We will include any questions in the mailbag episodes and any yelling at us about pronunciations. I will just pass right on to Dan to watch that little vein in his forehead keep pulsing. Or I'll just send them on to Tyler. <laughs> yeah. <fine. laughs> All right. <laughs> New job description, Tyler. Sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. So there are a few other semi-aquatic or amphibious races of intelligent creatures in D&D, including lizard folk and bullywugs, but we've pretty much tapped out on what 5th edition has to offer on them in previous episodes. So, that leaves us just one more. No, no. And it's a fucking doozy. Oh, no. Buckle up, people. Oh, fuck. It is time for the Kuotoa. Oh, no. The first thing you need to know about the Kuotoa is that they're terrible little monsters. They're humanoids with big, ugly fish heads on their shoulders, webbed hands and feet for swimming, and bulbous darting eyes. Brad. Their nasty, gnashing teeth give their large heads the impression of being piranha people, but they're not. They're far weirder and far worse. The third word in the Kuatoa section of the Monster Manual is degenerate, and oh. it all goes downhill from there. Not Brad Terry. They are literally the degens from upcountry. Yeah, okay, yeah, Terry. It's Terry. Terry's a Kuatoa in disguise. These neutral evil little fucks were driven underground en masse by the quote-unquote good races, aka the playable races, and they eventually made their way into the Underdark, where they lost the ability to stand the sunlight, but replaced it with the fun and interesting quirk of being totally batshit insane. You see, Kuatoa were evil, but simple, and when the mighty Illithid Empire captured and enslaved them, they couldn't handle the psychic tortures and complete mental subjugation. Let's be fair, who could? Everyone else, apparently, because nobody else did this. Their puny little fish brains popped like bubbles, <laughs> and the whole race <laughs> lost their ability to function. They were deemed useless by the Mind Flayers, and so the Kuatoa were abandoned in the dank, dark caves of the Underdark and left to die. Not even worth exterminating, just, well, we're done. This place smells like fish. Fuck off. I, God. I, 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 but, I, I, but, what? What do you have to... <laughs> The, the race of creatures who subsist completely on eating brains went, not worth it. Exactly. <laughs> so, the Kuatoa doubled down on their crazy bullshit and started inventing gods to save them. And somehow, this didn't lead to their downfall despite most things being able to kill these idiot anchovies. No. Instead, they got enough of their eggs all juiced up to go repopulate in large numbers, passing the crazy from generation to generation, folding it back in on itself until weird things started to happen. Weird, evil fish things. Terry could give you details. These ass-backward guppies have become such an issue in the Underdark that the drow don't even bother to enslave them. 
Instead, the drow just killed the stanky fish fuckers on sight. They recognize that the Kuatoa need to be exterminated, mostly because they have one really, really nasty trait. And that is if enough Kuatoa believe in one of their made-up batshit crazy gods, they can and will will the new god into existence. <sighs> you heard me correctly. These babbling loaches make gods. Maybe it's residual psychic generational trauma, but if enough of these moronic bubble blowers believe the same thing, their creation manifests some whatever physical form that the followers believe in. The book even says that the gods are often random and nonsensical. Giant squid? Sure. Six toasters all tied together by a fruit roll-up? Yep. <laughs> a gargantuan floating fleshy pile of prolapsed anuses that spits fire and sounds like Gilbert Gottfried and Bobcat Goldthwait putting on the world's first rap opera slash Vaseline orgy? That's right. Yeah, that too. Okay, it doesn't matter. There's no fucking limit to this Kuatoa insanity. They are crazy. They are evil. They are crazy evil. And they make gods. The one that they give you in the monster manual, Dan likes to pronounce, which is not how I would say it. It is uh, blip dool poop. Yeah, no, that's not at all what you fucking said. But whatever, she is the sea mother, who is a female human with the head and claws of a crayfish and an articulated shell that covers her shoulders. Just I hope, her shoulders? I hope to God that they imagined clothes because I don't want to know what crustacean bits she's got down there. And I bet she's got crabs. The writers of the Monster Manual guess that the Kuatoa might have found a broken statue, added crustacean parts to it, and then became overwhelmed with the new creation. I hate it, Dan. I hate it. I fucking hate it. I don't like weird stuff, and I think that the ocean is already terrifying enough, so I hate this. I would rather hang out in a crusty bus station than encounter a busty crustacean. Anyway, it says that whenever Kuatoa encounter an abolith, they tend to worship it as a god, which the Abolith uses to its advantage. Of course it does. <laughs> I also wonder if the warlock patron Ukatoa, that the Sahuagin worship, is one of these gods. After all, Ukatoa and Kuatoa are anagrams. And it would not surprise me if these idiots just misread their own fucking names. <laughs> <laughs> these are the kinds of conspiracies the big fish doesn't want you to know about, Dan. Anyways, so there's a basic breakdown of Kuatoa society, and it starts with the theocratic heads of the civilization, that's the archpriests. These are the biggest, best worshippers, and they act as high clerics. So I have a question. So if, if there's a high cleric of lip 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 is he, is he the pope de blip 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 The what? The pope de blip 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 No. Okay. Just no. <laughs> Just no. Archpope de blip 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 I'm going to start sounding like a reversing tape, like cassette tape. That's what I, want I, don't, I also don't know why your voice goes up an octave whenever you say blip, bloop, bloop. Because I, I, I don't know how else to blip, 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 blip. Like, you have a very deep and baritone voice. Sure. Anyways, these archpriests are the biggest, best worshippers, and they act as high clerics, right? They even get magical gifts from the deities that they bring into creation. And that creates a weird feedback loop of power that arch priests are thankfully too insane to control they make the thing that has all this power and the thing with the power gives them more power and then it just cycles yeah now these rubbery bottom feeders of existence do breed obviously and sometimes the arch priests will have children embracing nepotism much to the apparent delight of the demented masses the arch priests will assign their children to be included as some of their quote-unquote whips kuatoa whips are imbued with magic from the archpriest. So now we're just free flow and magic bullshit. Sure, yeah. Right? And the main function in society is to fight to the death to replace the archpriest when he or she dies. That's it. They stand around, they like wait. They're like the cardinals to the to the Pope. Yeah. And then as soon as they die, no, everybody die until there's one left, and that guy, that guy gets to run it now. Besides the standard Kuatoa, the only other info we get is about the Kuatoa monitor, which is included in a little variant sidebar. These monitors are deadly enforcers that focus on melee combat. Most Kuatoa will capture instead of kill, if given the chance, and they like to use nets, pincher staffs that are designed to grab and pin foes, and shields covered in sticky gloop. I don't want to know where they get the gloop from. They tend to avoid armor and they rely on their thick purplish hide instead. Really don't want to know where they get that goop from. Oh, yeah. And they like shiny things. Fuck, I hate these guys. I just... Anyway, something else I hate. Here's Dave, 
<laughs> coming to you from Eberron, where he has drudged up some unpleasant stats about these horrible man minnows. They're already unpleasant. Hey guys, Dave here again on Corvair. And I was talking to my guys last time, you know, the people that I'm with, uh, about amphibious creatures. And then we, we spoke about the Sahu again a couple of times, but uh, this time we came across the Koatoa, okay? Now, these Koatoa, I mean, these fish people are kind of fun, actually. If you look at the picture of them uh, in the book, they're, they they almost look excited, or the, the, the one that I'm looking at does. Uh, you know, they're medium humanoids. Uh, they do have an AC of 13 and 4 D8 hit points. Their speed is 30 feet, and their swim speed is also 30 feet. Their strength is a 13, and their dex, con, intelligence, and wisdom are all very, very, very average, okay? They don't get any bonuses to any of those, and their charisma actually is an 8, so they get a minus 1 to it. Uh, for skills, they have a perception of plus 4, and their dark vision goes out to 120 feet with a passive perception of 14. Uh, the only language that they speak is under common, and they're a CR 1 quarter. Now, for abilities, they do get uh, the amphibious ability, which means they can breathe air and water. It also gets another ability called Otherworldly Perception, in which it can sense the presence of any creature within 30 feet of it, uh, if it's invisible or if it's on the ethereal plane. Now, it can pinpoint such a creature uh, when it's moving, all right? It gets another ability called Slippery, which means it gets advantage on ability checks and saving throws that it uses to escape a grapple. Uh, they also have sunlight sensitivity, which when they're in the sunlight, they get disadvantage on attack rolls, as well as on perception checks that rely on sight. Now, now for actions, they do get a couple of different ones. They get a bite action, which is a plus three to hit, and does 1d4 plus one piercing damage, so not a lot. They get a spear, which is a melee or ranged weapon attack, which is a plus three to hit. Uh, it's got a range of 20 or 60 feet, and it does 1d6 plus one piercing. Uh, however, it does 1d8 plus 1 piercing if it's used with two hands to make a melee attack. The other weapon that the Koato have are nets. Now, a net is a ranged weapon attack with a plus 3 to hit, and its range is 5 or 15 feet. Uh, it can hit one large or smaller creature, and the target get, is restrained. Uh, a creature that is restrained by a net can use an action to make a DC 10 strength save to free itself or another creature that's in the net to end the effect uh, on a success. Now, if you also deal 5 slashing damage to the net, which has an AC of 10, uh, it frees the target without harming it and destroys the net, rendering it useless. One of the more interesting abilities that the Koatoa have is their ability to have a reaction, uh, which in this particular case is called Sticky Shield. When a creature misses a Koatoa with a melee weapon attack, the Koatoa can use its shield to catch the weapon. The attacker must succeed on a DC 11 strength save, or the weapon becomes stuck to the Koatoa's shield. If the weapon's wielder uh, won't let go of the weapon, or it can't, then it's grappled while the weapon is stuck. When stuck, the weapon cannot be used. Now, it can be pulled free by taking an action to make another DC-11 strength save and succeeding. I could see these guys really messing with your barbarian or any sort of frontline fighter. Just have a bunch of them with shields and just start catching them left, right, and center causing them to burn their action uh, in order to get their weapon back. It, I think, could be a fun way to level the playing field, even if your party is a little more advanced than the CR quarter challenge rating that these uh, that these Koatoa have. Uh, I, for one, like the idea of just using the Koatoa as, as just regular commoners, not necessarily having them fight the party, but having them interact in a meaningful way with the party. Uh, the culture difference between a Koatoa and the uh, the regular you know parties that you most people have anyways can link to some interesting role playing uh, between your people and the the, the Koatoa. Uh, I feel like you could really uh, throw your party for a loop uh, with how you want to run these because there's a hundred different ways that you could make these guys fun and interesting. Uh, and honestly, I think that there's some uh, some room here to make these guys be a little like slapstick comedy relief. Uh, they're sticky shields. I mean, you know, it, it can be quite fun, uh, especially with a slippery. Maybe, you know, that helps as well. You know, walking downstairs, they fall down. Yeah, like, again, you can have some slapstick fun with this. Uh, anyways, guys, uh, that's all I've got for today. So I'm going to send it back to Adam and Dan. If you guys want to get a hold of me, you can always find me on the r slash It's a Mimic subreddit. And until then, I will catch you guys next time. Dave has more of a stomach for these guys than I do. I fucking hate him. He also pronounces them Koatoa. 
and not Kuo Toa, which, I mean, I don't blame them. Uh, th- this is just another one of those ridiculous fantasy words. Yeah, Dave, we'll give you a free pass. Fuck you, Tyler. We'll give you a free pass, Dave. <laughs> so, anyway, I hate that these guys can sense invisible creatures or creatures on the ethereal plane if they're within 30 feet. If the creature moves, the Kuo Toa knows exactly where it is. I imagine them sniffing the air and slurping for smells, and I hate it. Yeah, and the fact that they have an ability called slippery is disgusting. These are gross creatures, and I don't like them, Dan. No, uh, it, that, yeah, I'm with you. I also know that Dave mentioned strength saves for escaping their nets or getting your weapon off of the sticky shield. Um, but I want to clarify that these are strength checks, not strength saves. That DC 10 or 11 is a little bit harder now for some characters. It's also nasty that freeing your weapon eats up your action. So you just know that's going to piss off all your martial characters. Yeah. Right? Look, I hate these guys, but they are useful and interesting and flavorful. Well, I They're fun. I don't, I don't necessarily want to taste them. I don't know about the you flavor. You don't want to talk about the flavor? No, not so much. So I, I imagine it's salty. <sighs> Anyways... Do you like Dave's suggestion of using them as comedy? How can you not? Oh, I think these guys are just super creepy. I'm going Lovecraftian with them. Uh, And I agree. They should go Lovecraftian. I just don't think they need to go Three Stooges like Dave is talking. Uh, I I don't see why you can't do both. Like, that surface level of Kuotoa is comedic as shit. You are going to undermine your Lovecraftian horror. I don't think so. If you, if you have that surface level of comedic as shit, and then you see this eldritch horror of the summoning of this deity coming from these guys, you are not prepared for that level of uh, intensity, right? You, I, I understand you might be doing yourself a bit of a disservice. I, I, I don't think so. I think you are actually aiding the, the hit of that as these comedy guys that your party doesn't take seriously... Suddenly, they very much have to take seriously. This is this is the, how the drow now approach them, as we mentioned earlier, right? Like, yeah, they may be goofy and weird and cackling and insane and and completely unhinged. But man, they're funny. They look funny. But you got to hit this tone real, really well. You need to know the players at your table. I feel like this is Evil Dead Two level of crazy. Not Evil Dead, or not the Army of Darkness. Not Evil Dead. But Evil Dead 2, where the hand comes off and then flips him off, but is a legitimate threat. Yeah. Right? There are all sorts of crazy, wacky things going on all through the movie. The deer head cackling and whatnot, but it's also crazy. Well, It's bad. I am a big proponent of humor in my horror. Just because it that breath of, of uh, levity intensifies the horror. My problem with this as, as is that well. my problem with this is that you're adding the comedic first, and so you are what you're doing is you're adding horror to your comedy, and it doesn't track quite as well. I guess that's fair. Okay, look, we I could go off on this for hours, but Jeff is in Barovia and he's covering Kuotoa, specifically their whips. What's up, folks? Reporting in from Barovia again, trying to stay sane. I've started to venture out of the camp more often during the day. Vistani keep telling me it's a bad idea, but what the hell else am I supposed to do? A few days back, I went with a couple of Vistani to another camp of theirs so I could visit the nearby town of Velaki. While I was there, I met this old priest named Father Petrovich, who was telling my Vistani friends about him on the walk back, but they didn't seem to think much of him. In fact, they told me about these fishy priests that they ran into once that they thought were far more interesting. They called them Kuotoa Whips. The Kuotoa Whip is a medium humanoid, they are neutral evil alignment. They have an AC of 11, which means they aren't carrying the shield that the regular Kuotoa are. They have an average of 65 hit points, which comes from 10d8 plus 20, which is more than triple that of their normal counterparts. They have the same 30-foot walk and 30-foot swim speed. Their strength is above average. Their dex is pretty average. Constitution is a little above average. Intelligence is okay. Their wisdom's pretty good. About on par with their strength and constitution, and their charisma is kind of flat. All their ability scores are increased over regular Kuotoa, except then the uh, dexterity. They have skill in perception and religion, a plus six and a plus four, respectively. They have 120 feet of dark vision and a passive perception of 16. They're more perceptive both actively and passively than the normal guys. 
they're going to be the first one in the group to spot you. They have one language they speak, which is under common, and they have a challenge rating of one. Other than their spell casting, their traits are shared with the regular Kuotoa. They are a spellcaster. This is the big thing that sets them apart from a regular Kuotoa. They're a second level spellcaster using wisdom and use cleric spells. Their spell save DC is 12, and they have a plus 4 to hit with their spells. They have four spells that they can cast, two of which are cantrips, Sacred Flame at the, you know, 1d8 variety, as well as Thaumaturgy, and two first level spells that they can use three slots to cast Bane and Shield of Faith. Sacred Flame gives them a ranged option to match the spear of the other Kuotoa. The Thaumaturgy, I like to think that they use most frequently to make their voices boom out over their fellow fanatics while preaching about their insane god of choice. Bane and Shield of Faith are both concentration. They can use one or the other. I think they would use Bane as soon as they have the range to use it, but that they would switch to Shield of Faith on themselves if they start getting attacked directly. It seems the right thing. They're probably a little bit cowardly in that respect. They have some interesting attacks. They get multi-attack, which is going to be one with a bite and one with their pincer staff, which is kind of fun, although I would flip that order. Their bite is a plus four to hit, reach of five feet, one target. It does an average of four piercing damage. That's one D4 plus two. The pincer staff is also plus four to hit, but has a ten foot reach, one target. If they hit, they do 1d6 plus 2 piercing damage, averaging 5. If the target is medium or smaller, it's grappled, and it's an escape DC of 14. Until the grappled target breaks the grapple, the Koto can't use its staff on another target. So basically, they grab and they hold on until they are forced to let go. Personally, I would have them use the pincer staff first and then bite on each on each round for attacks. It just makes more sense in context. They reach out with the staff, grapple the target, the next attack they pull the target closer and bite down. They then use any movement they have if they haven't used it already, and then try to drag their grappled target in whatever direction suits them, whether it be off a cliff, over the rail of a ship into the water, into melee range with allies or some other big nasty that's with them. I think, you know, that's kind of what I would use them for in a battle. All right, guys. Might be time to start meeting more locals around here and make a plan to escape. I don't know if it's going to work, but can't stay here forever. I mean, they tell me I have to, but I'm going to try not to. If you need me again, you know where to find me on Instagram at the zombie night, the dot zombie dot K-N-I-G-H-T. All right, let's get this tangent out of the way now. He says Valaki, okay? Terry says Valakai. Okay. What is it, Dan? Um, I am not the person to go What to- is it, Dan? Uh, so I've, I've played through Curse of Strahd. Yep. Um, and we called it Valaki. Um, and then you went, Dan, it's, it's got that Eastern, Eastern European, European feel. Fl- it's not Valaki. It's Va- uh, Valakai. Yeah. It's, it's Von Zerovic. It's not Von Zerovic. Yeah. Right. Like it is Eastern, like. I'm so glad that Terry DM'd that for us because he brought that European feel to it. Ter- when it comes to that kind of stuff, Terry's just... Like, he's, he's bang on. He he's good with that shit. the best of all of us when it comes to that shit. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the, the point is that I guess the American pronunciation is Valaki? I, I, uh, at least the Midwestern one. No, what? Jeff said another thing I wasn't expecting. He said that they get a bite and a pincer staff attack in their multi-attack. And then he said that he would flip that order. Are dungeon masters using the multi-attack options in the order they're presented in the stat block? Or have you always just been loosey-goosey with it? It will sometimes say in some stat blocks, first this, then this. So when it doesn't say that, and it's just and, I do it whatever order I want. If you can move, attack, move. If you can break up your movement and attack whenever, you can use your bonus action when you want. Yep. Why the fuck am I... Am I ordering my multi-attack when it doesn't say I have to? No, I'm like, Nowhere in any of the published material. Jeff, bud, bust your game open. You're doing it. You're doing yourself a disservice on this. I'm not going to say you're doing it wrong to each their own. That's fine. But you're right. Pincher first, bite second. Right? Like That's that's how you do it. Yeah. And I don't think that that's... The reason they list it in that order is because that's the order it's presented in the book. And they always they always say bite first. Yep. It always goes bite, claw, and then weapon attack, right? So 
So that's just the formatting issue. Okay, so there's an interesting variant on the Kuatoa whip that effectively turns the cleric into a monk. And I mentioned it before, this is the monitor, okay? Sure. It adds the wisdom modifier to its AC, bumping it up to 13. It loses the ability to cast spells and replaces the pincher staff with an unarmed strike that does 1d6 plus 2 bludgeoning damage and 1d6 lightning damage. Huh. An unarmed strike that hits makes it so that the target can't take reactions until the end of its next turn, Ooh. which is annoying, but it really helps with the mass retreat. And that's the thing that I like about Kuotoa is that by their standard lore, these things, if they get frightened enough, in previous editions, if you scare it badly enough, if they lose, I think it was a will save, they just fall over and die. Their mind snaps because you scared them too much. <laughs> so I see them as retreating, right? So th are, this tracks for me. Are we trying to say that Kuotoa are like, I don't know, somebody who um, either does all of the pre-production or post-production of a podcast and one loud, angry noise unexpected is just going to you know make them fall over and die I out of stress? I honestly think that these guys are borderline Shaggy and Scooby. Explain. They're running around in weird, dark, dank places all of the time, and they're—I mean, they're, technically, so was—and uh, and they're getting up to shit. They believe everybody that says there's a werewolf or a monster. They all just believe it. Yeah. And then they, they sit there, stomp around, and the moment that one thing looks at them funny out of the corner of their eye in a mirror, they are now running in and out of doors at random, bumping into each other and falling over and making weird, wacky noises. They're Shaggy and Scooby. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I mean. Fred was technically getting into dark and dank places too. We're not touching that, Dan. We're uh, stop, <laughs> stop it. Okay, back to the monitor, you fuck nugget. I also like that the monitor's multi attack is a little bit different. Okay, it's not just the unarmed strike replacing the the uh, pincher staff. Yep, they actually get two unarmed strikes. This gives a really good job at separating the kinds of Kuatoa. Okay, but you have to be aware of doing that because it's dangerous. These monitors are a CR3. They also get an attack modifier increase. It goes from plus four to plus six. Hmm. So they go from CR1 as the whip to CR3 as the monitor. Yeah. And with the unarmed strike and the lightning damage, they're going to back that up. Now, we have one last one to go through here. And, I mean, we, we spoke about Terry. He's in the Green Dragon Inn in Greyhawk, and he's covering the Kuotoa Archpriest. Okay, thanks Adam and Dan for passing it over to me. Uh, normally I say I get the good ones, and uh, while I don't think this is a bad one, it's just I'm not particularly excited by Kuotoa. I've got the Kuotoa Archpriest today, and it's just purely... I don't know what it is. I think I just like, as much as I like gritty, dark fantasy, I also like... Pretty fantasy. I don't mean like Legolas, who always seems to be perfectly clean. I just mean like, you know, those ugly, nasty, awful looking creatures that I'm just, ugh, I just don't want to be around it. I can imagine myself in that situation. They probably just stink, and I just don't want to look at them and listen to them and their stupid voices, and they're crazy and they create their own gods, and it just sounds like an absolute headache to deal with. And, uh, and and I don't want any involvement with them. But they're medium humanoids, Kuatoa Archpriests. Um, neutral Evil. I like Neutral Evil. I've talked about it before. You know, it's... For me, I mean, you may be Neutral Evil in that you don't care about another person's agenda, nor do you have your own in that you're like a zombie and you're just not even aware of the, the concept of an agenda. But uh, I like Neutral Evil enemies when they have an intelligence to them, a higher than average intelligence like a Kuatoa Archpriest does, um, because they're not going to think like you. And you, as the DM, that's difficult to pull off. That's diff How do I not think like I think? I think like I think. You just have to put all of your morality, your laws, your ethics, your uh, what you consider to be a value, your, your standards in some things. You have to put it to the side and you have to essentially manipulate your own character sheet to come out uh, with how these, uh, these creatures might think. Um, but they have an armor class of 13 with their natural armor hit points. It's 13 D8 plus 39. That average is out at 97. They have a swim speed 30 feet, and they have a walking speed of 30 feet as well. They're strong. Okay, they're strong and they're wise, and they've got a good constitution. Plus three modifiers for all of those. They don't really have any dump stats. 
you know, um, their, their dexterity and their charisma is well above that of an average human. Um, and their, their intelligence, they get a plus one modifier for as well. Look, these they are not stupid. They look ugly and stupid, uh, these Kuatoa Archpriests, but they're not. Okay, they're amphibious as well, of course, like the rest of the Kuatoa. They can breathe air and water. Otherworldly perception, the Kuatoa can sense the presence of any creature within 30 feet of it that is invisible or on the ethereal plane. It can pinpoint such a creature that is moving. What this tells me is that if you are just hiding, they can't sense your presence. This is otherworldly perception. If you are invisible, and by invisible, I, I don't, that is different to not visible. You know, it's not that you're in complete cover. If you are invisible or you're on the ethereal plane, they can pinpoint you. But if you're hiding behind a rock, not necessarily, because it's otherworldly perception. Uh, they're slippery. The Kuotoa has advantage on ability checks and saving throws made to escape a grapple. Look, that's going to be important, and I'm going to talk about that more later when I get to my own tactics, but being slippery is important. Sunlight sensitivity. While in sunlight, the Kuotoa has disadvantage on attack rolls, as well as their wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. But why would these creatures fight you on uh, on your terms anyway you know um, as best they can they're very intelligent they're they're smarter than you these fish people uh, and they're wiser than you are they have a better understanding of the world around them they have a higher charisma than the average person as well which means they have a better understanding of people as well they're not going to fight you on your terms if they can help it so you know any uh, any koto archpriest worth their salt right clever see um, is not going to fight you in direct sunlight. Spell casting. This Kuwato is a 10th level spell caster. Its spell casting ability is Wisdom, which gives it a spell save DC 14 plus 6 to hit with its spell attacks. And the Kuwato has the following cleric spells Cantrips of Will, Guidance, Sacred Flame, Thaumaturgy. Yep, sure. Come in with C bombs from Thaumaturgy if you want. Whatever. Stick a bit of guidance on somebody. Whatever you want to do. First level, Four Slots, Detect Magic, Sanctuary, Shield of Faith. Detect Magic. Detect magic is important for me, for these um, cleric type characters, because they are going to have a particular reason for being there, something they are looking for. And detect magic is is useful for enemies, because you are just walking meat sacks full of magic items in this game. And it might be that they are looking for that. They have gods that they worship, they create them themselves, so they exist not the less to them. Uh, it, and they, they, they create them, so they do exist. Uh, they would bring them gifts, they want to increase their own power. They, uh, they are intelligent enough to use this detect magic spell to find your items, to find your items, um, and, and likely try and take them from you. Uh, second level spells, they have hold person, spiritual weapon. I love spiritual weapon. You should be popping spiritual weapon all in. That should be automatic. The DM should not even finish the term roll initiative and you should just be saying spiritual weapon. Um, if not Bane, but that's not an option in this sense. Uh, third level, spirit guardians. Hey, if you're not popping spiritual weapons, you should be popping spirit guardians. Uh, tongues, whatever. Uh, what's the point in having a creature that speaks a different language to you um, if you're just going to use tongues? And I forgot all of that stuff, so I'll go over that in a second. Uh, but I hate tongues, you guys know that. Uh, fourth level, control water. Environment controlling spells are huge and they're not used often enough, okay? For some reason, a lot of players just become blasters with these things and DMs just become blasters. Remember, just as you create battle encounters for the players where their objective is not necessarily just to kill everybody, it's to maybe take something, it's to maybe protect something, it's to maybe move something from one place to another. It's the same with your enemies. Your enemies is not maybe, their object objective is not maybe just to kill all of the players, but maybe just to get something, to just, to, to harass them or to steal something or to move one person from one thing to somewhere else or to try and affect somebody's alignment. It's not always about killing everybody. And control water is an environmental manipulating spell which should be used to your advantage for whatever your agenda is to help you achieve that agenda divination divination is important i've got no problems with divination yeah i know divination spells in themselves are going to have a huge effect on your game and that your dm definitely needs to be aware of this how they're planning the game out but you know as long as you're willing to embrace them they they, they can be enjoyable um, fifth level for two slots, you get mass cure wounds, and you're smart enough to cure your own fish people, DM, you're smart enough to cure your own fish people, okay, uh, and you get scrying, so now we have scrying, so now this Kuwatoa Archpriest can use scrying to find out as much as they can about their enemy, your players, what they're carrying, what's valuable to them, what they're scared of, what their ideals are, 
what they what they want. All of this information, all of their their weaknesses, uh, can go after their their neutral evil. So they don't care about what you love to them. That is a target. You know, first we attack their heart. Um, this all comes from scrying. And then with scrying later on, we're going to start to use detect magic. If there's something from the scrying that we want, we're going to find it with detect magic. And maybe we'll even use hold person, or we'll use control water. And uh, you're especially going to love how the uh, the Kuatoa can use their sticky shields um, to capture weapons and, 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 and capture items. If there's another, you know, if, if, I don't know, if they're throwing a table leg or something, I suppose you're going to capture that. But, uh, but if you're aware of specific magic weapons, you can capture them now. You can take them away. Now I know players are gonna cry when they lose their magic irons, but honestly, just like I've got, I have no time for crying players. And this this exaggerated as the years went on with me playing D and D. But just the game is meant to be difficult. It's meant to be a challenge. Now it can't be on easy mode. Grab your balls or your lady balls and get over it. If your magic item gets taken from you, I've had so many magic items taken from me, and it just made the game better because it just gave me something else to move toward. You can't just walk around with five fucking long swords and battle axes strapped to your back wearing three suits of armor. Okay, your stuff's gonna get taken from you sometimes because it is valuable to other people. Okay, bit of a rant there, but um, look, sticky shield and, uh, and the, the abilities from this Archpriest uh, are gonna be are gonna be great for that kind of thing. They have multi attack. They can make two melee attacks with their scepter. They have a scepter plus six to hit, reach five feet, one d six plus three bludgeoning damage. And you can use that scepter if you've run out of everything else. Um, it'll also cause four d six lightning damage as part of that as well. Yeah, I guess you know that causes a good bit of damage. But I'm probably still gonna be at the back using other tactics. If I'm if you're using the arch priest here to, to cause damage, it tells me things are going wrong. Um, unarmed strike, melee weapon attack, plus six, reach five feet, one target, one d4, plus two bludgeoning damage. Look, why not? Why not? I like. Why did they list that? Can't just about everything do an unarmed strike? If you drop your weapon, you're doing an unarmed strike. Sure, they listed it. They thought that that was important to mention. That's totally fine. But look, the important thing to take away from these is that they're ugly little slippery fellows and um, it, it, while I don't enjoy them at all, they are, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be difficult to deal with if the DM plays them properly. Look, I'll throw this in at the end because I forgot to mention it earlier. They do have skills, perception, plus nine, religion, plus six. They have dark vision of 120 feet, makes sense. Passive perception of 19. Languages are under common. Languages under common. Just under common. So you can't communicate with them. Uh, well, unless you speak under common. Um, or unless you're cast in tongues. I guess, but uh, you know, that's when you have a, an enemy that you don't understand, that you don't understand why they do things, or why they don't think like you, or why they're hurting you, or why they're taking your stuff. Um, it's it's made even more interesting when you can't understand them. Challenge rating six. I think you can put this challenge rating. Uh, I think you can make it higher by using the Kuatoa Archpriest and their minions effectively, uh, and you'll have a great game. Okay, that's everything I've got on the Kuatoa Archpriest. I'll catch you guys next time. Uh, ugly one, you know, use it if you have to, but uh, they will be fun. I, I, I find it funny that for Terry, any enemy with scrying is stalking the party. Like, just straight up stalking the players. It's hilarious. Uh, yeah. The, the moment that he sees scrying, he assumes that they're, they're watching creep. everything that they do. Yeah. You know that if you were to give Terry the ability to scry... Oh, that... Uh, the, yeah, we're hitting some like. Mm. There, there's some character assassination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's gonna watch me poop. Oh, every single time you do. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, this is the second time now, Dan, in this episode that we have seen a healer among the masses. And you said before that the uh, Sahu again. We were talking about them, and they could heal. You didn't like that. No. This right here earns the archpriest its CR six to me. Yeah. It's going um, to keep that battle going. And funny enough, I don't mind it with the Kuto Archpriest. Archpriest. I don't mind it. Um, because of the bonkers summoning of random deities. I mean, sure, they're going to get random spells. They just so happen to get cures. Yeah. We also know that these guys, as much as like the loud noises and they'll fall over and die from previous editions still kind of exists as a wisp in the rules here, um, these guys are survivable. They went through enslavement from the Illithids and um, 
constant attacks from the drow who we see some drow who are what they go up to cr21 cr20 cr20 like they get up there and they're still uh, around these oh, guys oh, you, are survivable you mean they're survivors yeah okay yeah that's what i mean with these guys and and um i don't think it's an intentional surviving i just think they, they fell ass backwards into it they somehow continue to exist and and it is going to be nothing but oozes and Kuatoa that are left after yeah. the apocalypse. Yeah. And and whatever ass backwards Chris, half crustacean, half statue woman that they worship. Man, just like I mean, okay, so let's 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 move on. Terry's right that the unarmed strike is an odd choice with these guys. I mean, we get it with the monitors. It's weird that we get it with these guys. I mean, normally an unarmed strike is just does one plus strength modifier bludgeoning damage. And this does 1d4 plus 2, which, now that I'm looking at it, the normal way does 4 damage, and this does an average of 4. Okay, yeah, this this seems dumb. Where's the bite attack on top of all this? Yeah, I I don't know why they did I, I would just give them two attacks with the... Look, I guess the unarmed strike is for when you want to capture someone and do non-lethal damage. Sure. Remember that the scepter does the 46 lightning damage. Give me a sec. Okay, the player's handbook says sometimes an attacker wants to incapacitate a foe rather than dealing a killing blow. When an attacker reduces a creature to zero hit points with a melee attack, the attacker can knock the creature out. The attacker can make this choice the instant the damage is dealt. The creature falls unconscious and is stable. It also says that damage types have no rules of their own, but other rules such as damage resistance rely on these types. So... Does that mean that you can do non-lethal damage with this lightning from, sure. from the scepter? It's it, not a spell or a ranged attack or anything stupid like ability drain or falling damage. So does this mean you can choose to do non-lethal lightning damage? Yes. So you can just pull back your elemental damage when you can I do it with a necrotic attack from a from a incorporeal as undead? written? Yes. Wow. That kind of blows shit open for me as a DM. Mhm. I have been relying on unarmed attacks to do that last little bit of damage to capture. Well, it, it's it's the... I mean, I would play this with... Uh, if if I'm going to allow any type of damage to knock out, doesn't matter what it is. You can knock out somebody with poison damage somehow. Sure. Right? Um, I would have the death from massive damage rules in place as well. Yeah, but I always do anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that makes your lower levels far more deadly. Far more deadly. Yeah, well, look. Because even if you're just choosing to knock them out, you do enough damage, that choice is removed and you're killing them. Sure. That's a risk I'm willing to take, Dan. It really is. So, let's grab our dice and let's roll. I have some questions now, alright? So, let's roll initiative. I got a 15. Okay, I got a 5. So, Dan, when you look at how these Kuotoa are are built... What is the implication of them? Like, how how does this society work? What is their social structure? And when, when you find a settlement, what does that look like? I mean, they are in underwater ruins, somewhere in a deep, dark cave. It's going to take you some time to get to them. You're not going to accidentally stumble upon Kuatoa, right? Um, uh, they are going to be in a very remote location. And... You will hear them before you see them because they are doing nothing but chanting. These are the most committed cultists you will ever find. Oh, absolutely. They are the most committed. Right. This is ridiculous. Like, um, their random bullshit gods just make it so that they have food at all times. They are all their entire the reason why they're able to uh, conjure these deities into existence is because they do nothing but believe in that deity. That is their calling. That is what they do. It's what they, it's, it's the only thing. When they're eating breakfast, they're thinking about the deity. When they are hunting down smaller fish, they are thinking about the deity. When they are sitting there just beating their little fish sticks, they're thinking about their deity. Fish sticks. Fish sticks. Do you like fish sticks, Dan? Not anymore. Oh, did you? Kind of. Huh. Did you like fish sticks? Then you're a gay fish. I can't believe you don't get that reference. Dave, 
I'm disappointed in Dan. We will educate him later. Just get it, man. Why don't you get... Never mind. Fuck. Anyways, I I, I agree. This is all about their deity. The archpriests, the whips, the, the monitors. They're just keeping them... But I mean, they're slavers, too. Yeah. What are they enslaving people for? Uh, sacrifices. Is there anything else beside that? No. Maybe food. Maybe food. Do you think that they enslave just because that's what everyone down here does? That's the way... The- oh, uh, they... they <laughs> Uh, what, what, what's the saying? Abusers abuse. Yeah. Right. Not to get dark on this, but like all these guys have ever known is enslavement. You mean the abused abuse? Yes. Yeah. Right. And so that's, do you think that these guys are, are pitiful in a way? I think that they are like in my head, they are definitively pitiful. That's why I don't like the comedy of this. I want it to be really dark. I want you to walk away being like, we killed those guys and it was a mercy and I feel dirty. Let's get drunk. Yeah, I I, I could see that. That's my kind of campaign. Terry's on board with me on that. You and Dave are... Rup, bup, 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 bup. You guys are Zoidberging your way through That's this. because we have uh, Sahuagin and uh, and Murrow to really dive into the horror side. The, the scary thing about these guys is that they can conjure gods. That is the scary thing about them. I desperately want to create a just shit ton of D20 tables... Left arm, right arm, head, eyes, ears, nose, and it's just different things. And then you build your own Kuatoa god. And it's going to be just random shit. One of the options for left ear is going to be egg beater. Like, it is going to be just (laughs) batshit insanity. I want there to be just weird shit. But you have to remember, these guys don't have an intelligence and imagination. Like, they're smart. Like, they are actually smart enough. But they don't have... Their imagination is not able to really branch out. They stumble upon their shit all of the time, right? So if that's what they're doing here, you have to have a reason for these these gods to be the way that they are, right? The way that they say about um, blip doop boop. Blip doop boop. God, you're annoying. The the way that it was... <laughs> that it might have just been a statue that they put bits and pieces of a crayfish on. Honestly, I, I, I had... Lightning has struck my brain. I've had an apostrophe. The... Uh, I'm not even... T- yeah. <laughs> um, Wait a minute. Smee is me. Anyways, continue. <laughs> Smee! Uh, the... I... We talked about the uh, merfolk scavenger earlier on in this episode. And you have that, like, idea of Ariel's little library that she has. Her little museum that she has in the water in The Little, little Mermaid. Right? That features the statue of Prince Philip, I think. I don't know, man. You're was, the one with, like, young girls. Honestly, it, it's more my wife that is a Little Mermaid fan than anyone else in my household. Anyways, the, uh, the Kuatoa are the guys who moved into that place with this one random yeah, yeah, statue. Yeah, like and went, oh, oh that's shit. a god. That's really cool. Like, you think about the figurehead on the front of a ship that yeah. sunk, and then they worshipped it. Yeah. This is where they should be coming up with these gods, not random this, tables. This is You You want to have an interesting thing to do with uh, Murrow that isn't? Uh, they were bl- brought into this realm by uh, Demogorgon. How often on the uh, prow of a ship, the figurehead, is it a large bestial looking half man half uh, 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 fish creature the Kuatoa brought these horror fuel body horror level underwater terrors into existence they're not deities necessarily the Kuatoa treats them treat them as such but they're still these large sized everything like um, that arc of worship got crossed with a merfolk you know you, you, you inspire me every time that i run across something that doesn't make sense in the D lore now every time that i've run up against like like merfolk just don't fucking fit anywhere yeah ah, a kuatoa did it sure i was gonna handle it. it's not a wizard did it a kuatoa dreamt it yeah any aquatic monstrosity was because a kuatoa just dreamt it up one day yeah i like that okay so um i want i want to just take a second and point out that we've got um just a little bit more information here, and that's when you make a Kuatoa NPC. I don't know why you fucking would. Like, you're a Kuatoa merchant. Sure. All right. Look. But here's what you get. You get that otherworldly perception, 
right? So your ability to see invisible things. My heels are out of this world. You are amphibious. You get that slippery thing, so you get advantage with that with getting out of grapples. Sunlight sensitivity, speed of thirty feet, your your walking speed and your swim speed, and uh, dark vision one hundred and twenty feet. And of course, you get to speak under common. Dark vision one hundred twenty feet is huge. Yeah, but this is for building an NPC. Like it's not for your. It's not for. It's not for a PC. No, it's not for one of your player characters. Um, there's a lot of shit going on here. I I just don't. I don't see the point of ever needing to do this. I don't see them getting along with other people. No. You're not going to have a Kuatoa um, noble. You're, not, you're going to be like, hey, what are you doing? Ah, I'm masturbating. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like they're just, I just assume, Fuck. I just assume that they are the, the <laughs> with with a sense of like surprise. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just like fuck. I feel bad for any animal that is anywhere near these things. You know that fish and everything are avoiding. Oh yeah, where these guys are. And remember, they're in the underdark too, right? So as much as you say they're underwater ruins and whatnot, I also see them as just like. I know that you haven't seen the Harry Potter movies, but that there's one part where um, uh, Harry and Dumbledore go to get an artifact, a specific Horcrux they need to get. And there's this giant pool of water with a like crystalline, um, almost island that they've got to row out to get to with an altar on top of it. Okay. And it's all in a cave. That is how I see a Kuatoa area. They live underwater. There are some fish that come through little underwater openings that they're eating all the time and they're licking the algae off the walls. But they also have an altar and a shrine that they will get up and they'll all just like sit at the surface and sit there and float while the archpriest is is prancing around screaming insanities. Their mouths, in my world, from here on out, all Kuatoa mouths glow when they're open because they're licking the bioluminescent ah, stuff funny. off the walls. Yeah. And uh, it's got hallucinogenic properties as well, which helps feed this insanity. I, that, okay, that's a load of fun. If you could just detox them, they'd be absolutely yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. What's your name? Oh, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> uh, like, I, I really I really think that they are absolutely... <laughs> what? <laughs> Takes off the big fish head and it's just a dude. In, in a mascot <laughs> suit? Like, yeah. Fuck, you're the one. Just got stuck in it. I'm telling you, the Shaggy and Scooby. That's what this <laughs> is. Oh, man, that makes a masturbating joke a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. Fucking chum buckets everywhere. Anyway... Let's roll again. I want to know how they fit into the realm of underwater creatures. Sure. I got a 10. Seven. I'm going first this entire episode. There we go. How they fit into the realm of underwater creatures. They are the um, foot soldier for Eldritch Horror. Yeah, I can see that. Right. Um, if I wanted, because of their amphibiousness, which I love, but I'm not but necessarily... Remember, Cthulhu is going to pop up and be like, do my bidding. And they're going to be like, ah, and the brain pops. They've had an aneurysm and I'll just like flop on the yes, ground there. But Cthulhu comes into the realm, not because all of the uh, squid cultists on the land have enslaved and made an entire population mad. No, because the Kuatoa are already mad. The Cthulhu comes into this realm because the Kuatoa willed him to. Yeah, all right, look. Right? I, but, like, I, but I see them as being useful minions, but they're not army. They're not a... Who would they Who would they serve? They've made it away from the drow. They've made it away from the uh, illithid. The Kuatoa are slaves to no one, and not because they are genuinely creative enough to as, get out as, of it. Asmodeus, Grazd. These are the guys that are going to be able to say... Hey, no, 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 guys, calm down. It's all good. I, hey, look at these powers. You have to, if you want to control them, you got to be gentle with them. No, no, no. It's not going to be Asmodeus. Asmodeus isn't going to be able to handle their chaos. It's not going to be Gratz because Gratz going to look into them and be like, y'all fuckers ugly and walk away. He's not going to want anything to do with them. It's going to be Zugtamoy. It's going to be Demogorgon. It won't be Zugtamoy. Zugtamoy doesn't want anything no, to do with... No, if they're licking algae off walls, which I understand is just a thing that we put in, but they're goddamn crazy. It's... Having some sort of fungal infection to uh, uh, to spawn all this isn't out of the realm of possibility. Having Zug Tamoy be the one to like drive that Zug Tamoy still wants people to lose their shit, still wants people to be crazy, right? I don't see why Zug Tamoy can't and 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 
Zug Tamoy is also very under uh, supported with minions. I mean, Baphomet's got Minotaurs, and somehow that's sufficient. And Gorgons, and somehow that's sufficient. The Gratz has all of the things that do you to death. Um, Orcus has all undead. You got nothing for Zug Tamoy other than like evil uh, Mykonids? I guess. Yeah. So you're, so you're gonna give her Kua Toa? I'm gonna give that's her Kua Toa. That's a that's that's a slap in the face, isn't it? I mean, how else would uh, Zug Tamoy have come to exist? A bunch of Kua Toa saw a, a, a sexy looking mushroom in one cave somewhere, and all of a sudden, a demon prince. <laughs> Okay, do you have any campaign ideas then besides Zug Tamoy? Yes, all of them. You just, like, whatever it is. Whatever yeah. big, bad, evil guy. Strahd only exists. Barovia and, and Ravenloft exist in their demiplane because Kuatoa dreamt it up. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, yeah. we could just, this is this is the, the end of, what was it, the Saint Elsewhere, where there's that one autistic kid looking at the snow globe and the whole series took place in his mind. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you could really zoom way out on this. Yeah, you... it's it's uh, the end of the Bob Newhart show. Yeah. Where he wakes up and the entire series was just a dream. Yeah, I don't know. That's That sucks. When you oh. find out at the, the end of your... You've been playing the same campaign for seven years. <laughs> okay, don't do that shit. But, I, like, for me... Having the Kua Toa, um, creating a god is 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 not just going to be, you know, you believe it's so hard it happens. There's going to be some worldwide effects that are going to start to occur that the Kua Toa just are oblivious of. There are earthquakes and storms and hurricanes and, and the world is being torn asunder. The weave is shattering because the Kua Toa are believing super hard. But they're underwater in a cave. They're as, as isolated as it gets. So the world is going to shit. Your party's trying to figure out what's going on. And it's just an, enormally, an abnormally large sized tribe of Kua Toa gurgling at their most powerful. And honestly, because they're amphibious, because they have that ability to just live above ground if they want to, nothing is saying these guys have to be aquatic, other than the fact that they have fish heads. I'm going to... Okay, I like all of that. But you have inspired me to, to see that these guys are far more powerful than anyone gives them credit for. And who is the smartest person in D&D, in all of the lore? Asmodeus. Right. Would he not realize that to make gods... Is an incredibly useful tool. I just I just see Asmodeus with like a checklist. And he's gone, alright. I've tried just giving them a weird statue. That didn't work. That thing I had to kill. Good lord did I have to kill that thing. Alright, well, and then I tried to just make them all hallucinate the same thing. And again, what came out was not what I wanted. Like, like he just all, keeps on trying. All of, the, all of the weird big bad aberrations that, that the party's run into for the last eight levels have just been failed attempts to build a god. Fucking beholders. I mean, I gave them a tennis ball and they came up with a beholder. I don't understand. I mean, meanwhile, there's just like, they're just down in the water. <laughs> Doing it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fuck. I'm into it. I like it. That's fucking weird. Anyway, so. At this point, Dan and I are just going to get weirder, so we're going to wrap up the episode. That's everything that we could find in 5th edition on the rest of the aquatic mobs, but there's still a lot more to cover. Don't forget to come back next week when we... You know what? Fuck it. We're done with mob episodes, Sure, Dan. I'm done. All right. We're going to wrap it up next episode, and then we're going to move on, and let's try to get back to our regularly scheduled program. So that's it for this episode of the It's a... So that's... Ep so that's it for this episode of the it's a mimic podcast if you'd like to support us you can head to www.itsamimic.com and hit our fancy donate button or tell your friends family loved ones and the rest of your D party and i'll tell tell your enemies i don't care just spread the word please tell them about the podcast grab we all are... your friends in a room and scream it into the void to believe <laughs> We are available on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. Stay safe out there. And... <laughs> Thank you for listening to another It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, shoutouts, requests, and mailbag questions can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. So this week got me thinking a lot about all of the 
awesome creatures that live in the sea. Now, obviously, I would be a super cute mermaid, but what kind of undersea creature would you guys be, and why? Feel free to assign some to everybody else, too. Bull fucking shit, you're not a mermaid. Oh, harsh. <laughs> harsh. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Let's roll. I got uh, I got a 10. I got a 9. All right, Peps, you you you're not a mermaid. You are the Kuatoa priestess. You think so? Oh, well she is dreaming those freaking minis into existence. Uh, th- that's the only way to explain and the, she's ex- the, she's expanding her freaking it's group. The only here. way to ex- it is the only way to explain the rate at which she paints and produces content. I don't get it. That woman is the busiest woman in Dungeons and Dragons. She makes Satine Phoenix look lazy. So what are you then? What am I? No, 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 no. Let's just move down the list. We'll figure it out. I'm not going to title myself. We got, we're, we're going to be going off each other here. So Dave. What is Dave as an underwater creature? He's a Zoidberg. <laughs> All right. What about Brad? Um, you know that, that fish that when you pull it out of the deep kind of gets all blue. Oh, it, the, what is it? The blob fish or whatever yeah, it is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's poor Brad. We are not being nice <laughs> to anybody. Terry. <laughs> Terry. Um, Terry's a seahorse. Have you seen the videos of seahorse giving birth? That is why he's a seahorse. Oh my god! Okay, and Megan, I oh, dare angelfish. <laughs> well done, well done. Okay, um, Jeff. Jeff. Uh, so you know how uh, giant squids are iconic and wonderful, and um, are like the OG sea monster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff is one of those like little. Uh, cephalopod thing he's a cephalopod he's a cephalopod okay all right james um uh james um octopus you think he's an octopus he's the smartest person on this podcast you think so oh yeah uh kyle kyle he's a sea he's a sea cucumber oh yeah yeah nick nick's a starfish is he yeah yeah he he stays in one spot eats the scum off the side of the of the of the aquarium is that because he keeps DMing for you and killing your players? Uh-huh. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tyler. Um, clownfish. <laughs> Fuck. You were just like assassinating him. <laughs> be, okay, Travis, be nice to him. We need him. <laughs> yeah, we need we need him. Uh, uh, Travis is the great white shark. Why? Oh, because he's the single most powerful person in the sea. Uh, okay, uh, and now do yourself. No, no, no. Uh, you first. What are you? Uh, oh, then you're going to respond in kind, depending on what I say? Yeah. yeah. All right. If Dan was an underwater creature, Dan would be... I wasn't expecting to, to, to do yours. Uh, you would be... I got one for you. Yeah, what do you got? Yeah, you're you're a sea enemy. Because you're like my enemy, but not quite. You're a starfish too, Dan, but it's a chocolate starfish. Gross. So can you choose to do... So can you choose to do... So can you choose to do? <laughs> Thank you for listening to an It's a Mimic production. <laughs> okay, you're done. Get it. <laughs>